Light the fires. The great hunt begins. I could not have said it better myself. Do I even need to introduce our game for this video? Unless you've been living under a rock these past few weeks, then you'll know that one of the most anticipated games of 2023 released on Friday the 20th of October, Spider-Man 2. I rarely pre-order games, but for this one, I was prepared to sell my own body to get my hands on it as soon as possible and get cracking on my own great hunt, that of the Platinum Trophy. And this video is going to be a chonky one, as there's a lot to go through, and because this is probably one of my favorite Platinums ever, I didn't want to limit what I include in this video. We'll be starting by going over the main story of the game and the trophies we unlock for doing so, before delving into each of the side missions and the other miscellaneous trophies. I've included chapters in the video to help you navigate through if you're only looking for a specific section. So, make yourself a coffee or a cup of tea, grab some snacks, and strap in. Before we get started, if you're someone who is constantly chasing the endorphins of that trophy unlock sound... Okay, cool. Oh, nice. Just like me, then make sure you leave a like on this video and subscribe to the channel for a brand new trophy or achievement hunt every single week. And now, without much further ado, welcome to this week's endorphin hunt. Let's get into it. Our story starts two years in the past, where we finally get a glimpse into what was happening with Harry Osborne, who was noticeably absent from the first game aside from guiding us in our research station missions. Shooting forward into present day, we're reintroduced to Miles, who is struggling to write his college application essay, and Peter, who has somehow managed to snag a job as a teacher at Miles' school. And pretty much immediately, we learn once again that Spider-Men do not get to live normal lives, when Miles' spidey sense starts to tingle and he calls Peter to the roof. How would you ever hope to be a teacher as Spider-Man? That, that's a silly I'm job so to choose. Oh, the hype is real. And the swinging feels crisp in this game, even better than the first one, I'd say. You have more control, the movements are more fluid. Yeah, I don't know how they managed to improve on perfection, but here we are. Our heroes soon arrive at, oh, holy crap, he's freaking huge. Man, someone's been hitting the gym. Look at them gains. Sandman serves as our introduction to the game, and what an introduction it is. We're retaught some old tricks, such as the mechanics of aerial and ground-based combat, as well as a couple of new ones. We soon figure out that water and electricity is a dangerous combination for a man made of sand, leading into our final showdown with Sandman, in which we get to see the two Spider-Men truly team up for the first time. By harnessing the electrical power of the storm raging around him, they manage to channel it through Miles and Peter's spider arms to literally cut Sandman in half. Brutal. Marco is captured and shipped off to the raft, but not before he gives us an ominous warning. If you need help, all you have to do is ask. You're the ones who are gonna need help when they come for you. And who are the they that he speaks of? Craven and his hunters, who, after struggling to find an equal for Craven, set their sights on New York as their new hunting ground. And as Craven's hunt begins, so does ours with our first trophy of the run. You're gonna need help. With sand covering basically every inch of New York, Peter and Miles take some time to do some friendly neighborhood spider manning. We also get introduced to the brand new skill tree, with Peter and Miles each having their own specific one, as well as one shared between them. Pretty cool. Back to the city, and we have one more person who is in need of assistance. Uh, uh, hospital. Uh, Jay Jonah Jameson. Ha ha! Of course it is. Hey, Spider-Man. Hey, buddy. Who it is? One. Uh, where am I? Spider-Man. Jonah, my sunshine. <laughs> you okay? Help! I've been abducted. What? No, isn't he adorable? With the city a bit calmer, 
Miles and Peter return to their second lives and face the consequences of being Spider-Man. Miles is missing out on opportunities pertaining to his education and future, and Peter just straight up gets fired. Maybe I'm not going to be the only one selling my body. Well, better head home and break the news to MJ. But before we do that, we make a quick pit stop to change out of our sandy suit before any more of it slips into places that it's never coming back from. The suit system of this game differs from the first in two major ways. One, each unlockable suit no longer has a suit power associated with it, which, I'm not gonna lie, was a little disappointing to learn and kinda made buying the suit with any urgency redundant. And two, some suits now have craftable styles attached to them, allowing you to change the colors to something you find a little bit more stylish, like this pink and black combination for the advanced suit on Peter. Oh, fit. And for changing into it, we earn stylish. All right, can't put it off anymore. Time to tell MJ the bad, wait, she rides a motorbike now? And people online really have the audacity to say this woman isn't attractive? Have a word with yourselves. MJ takes the news pretty well and is really supportive actually, but needs to shoot off when she gets a tip that some high profile criminals are being moved from the raft. She heads out to find out more, but then... MJ! <laughs> Harry! Whoa. Oh, it's just Harry, a friend. Yeah, Harry has only ever been a friend to Spider-Man. <clears throat> anyway, while MJ heads off to work, Harry takes us on a trip down memory lane, culminating in offering us a job as co-founder at his new startup company the Emily May Foundation. Peter decides to think it over and visit the lab as soon as he can. But first, we got some hero work to do, specifically babysitting the transfer of the raft criminals, Scorpion and Mr. Negative, the latter severely pissing off Miles. And as you've probably already guessed, things don't exactly go to plan when Craven's hunters attack and try to kidnap the two villains. We put up a valiant attempt to stop them, with Miles even considering letting civilians get chopped up like sardines in a cannery so that he can hold on to Lee, but we're ultimately unsuccessful, and our enemies are soon in the wind. The next day, we meet Harry at the Emily May Foundation for our talk. We learn about the work that the company is doing, and also learn that Harry is being treated for his illness by none other than Dr. Connors, who is apparently feeling better after his previous rampages as the lizard. Seems like a perfectly safe idea that couldn't go wrong at all. After some back and forth, Harry convinces Peter to join the company, which was about damn time to be honest. But it does also mean that Peter needs to phase out his tutoring job, aka stop being Spider-Man? Ooh, some of the fanboys really aren't going to be happy about that one. Fortunately for them, that won't be happening anytime soon, as we head straight on to another mission tracking the hunters. This introduces us to one of our side missions, the Hunter Blinds. In the first one, we find out more information about the hunters, meet some friendly puppers, and find out exactly what they're up to in New York. He broke his tail. Yeah, he's hunting them. I thought he was. My disappointment. Brutal. And it looks like we know who's next on the chopping board. We switch to Miles and start tracking down Black Cat, who seems to be hunting for the Wand of Watoom. And where does she find said wand? In the freaking Sanctum Sanctorum. Oh, what I wouldn't give to have an expanded Marvel Universe of Insomniac games. Black Cat appears with the wand and we give chase in probably one of the coolest sequences of the entire game, before being cornered by the hunters and agreeing to team up against them. We kick their asses in no time and find out what Black Cat has been up to. She tells us that her girlfriend, dub for the bisexuals, is trapped in Paris and in deep with some bad people, so she needs to get there and help her. And because Miles is a cutie patootie, he agrees to help her. How about Felicia? Thank you. 
Miles then tries to use the wand to find Lee, but it disappears in his hand, being replaced with a note from Wong. I guess that's as close as we'll get to a crossover, so sure, I'll take it. Alright, I think it's about time we all took a break and had a bit of fun to cool off. So we head to Coney Island and check out the hot new kid on the block, the Mysterium, which is run by a reformed former supervillain, Quentin Beck, previously known as Mysterio. Really starting to notice a trend with this game and the idea of second chances. The Mysterium is actually really fun and allows Miles to live out his fantasy of being a DJ. That is, until the Mysterium begins malfunctioning somehow, leading to us needing to finish our set in order to fix it before swinging to safety. Well, that was definitely... something. It turns out that Miles isn't the only one having a night off when he runs into Peter, MJ, and Harry. We switch to Peter and work our way through the rides and attractions at Coney Island to earn our special prize. I mean, it's gotta be that one, right? Like, that's cool as fuck. Looking good, Pete. Hell yeah! <laughs> Off, right? this Thought I would have gotten a trophy for that, to be honest, but um, no bother. But of course, this is Spider-Man, which means the fun can't last forever. I have my hat up. Ah! Which super are you hunting this time? Would you like a panda? The hunters are here to capture another familiar face from our past, Tombstone, who has also been turning his life around by working at the go-karts. Unfortunately, despite our best efforts, we once again fail to save him from being captured, instead trying to save a group of civilians trapped on a roller coaster. And then, for a moment, it looks like we're about to fail a second time. Is he gonna fail? What?! <laughs> so many emotions felt in this moment. Wait. You know what this means, right? We both have superpowers. Uh. Just think about all the stuff we could do to heal the world. Yeah, you need Sorry. to control that shit. I uh, guess I still got to figure out how this thing works. Well, it's a real shame neither of us has a state-of-the-art science lab to run some tests. After a night of destroying the lab, we scarpered to avoid the telling off from Norman Osborn and set our sights on locating Tombstone. Thanks to a tip we received from Black Cat, we managed to pinpoint his location. Of course, this involves a lot of punching and webbing, but this time we're joined by a new companion, Harry, dressed in perhaps the worst outfit I've ever seen. And to go along with the terrible outfit, he's also a terrible teammate, basically making ridiculous decisions that send the entire compound into self-destruct. Lovely. We find Tombstone, eventually manage to break him free, and then make a run for our lives. Oh shit. Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's just all calm down. Oh my God. someplace safe to go yeah they come for me again i'll be ready tell your friend thanks for looking at nicely me. done violet see you around spider hmm i actually really like tombstone so this was a nice ending to see peter and harry get a call from mj saying that dr connors has been kidnapped by the hunters her phone is knocked out of her hand whilst talking and, before she can get it back, she's locked in a hunter's van and driven away. You know what that means, it's time for everyone's favourite mission type, an MJ mission! By the way, I actually have nothing against these missions and find them really fun. I just know how many people online seem to really hate them. We're taken to an abandoned zoo and, with a stun gun and trigger finger at our disposal, manage to track down Connors. You know this beast. Oh fuck. <laughs> Wait. 
well, that's not what you want to see. Peter and Harry tear through stacks of hunters while MJ and Connors try to put together a serum before he turns. And do I even need to say how that goes? Eh, probably not, but it gets even worse. Oh, damn, son. What the fuck? Almost there. Hang on. Hang on. Harry. Pete. Please stay with us. Stay awake, buddy. No! And as Peter takes his last breath, we're left with the sorrow of his girlfriend and best friend as the screen fades to black. Nah, just kidding. Yeah, I thought that would happen. What happened? And now, whew, now we really get to whoop some ass. Oh God. Uh, <laughs> oh hell yeah that felt good i do worry if i ever got a taste of the symbiote in real life i'd just end up a slave to it as well but then again a skin tight spider-man suit wouldn't necessarily suit me either later that night peter tries to give the suit back to harry but to no avail Realizing they need Dr. Connors to teach them about how the suit works, they get to work using Craven's knife to track him down to reacquire the antidote for the lizard. And after a considerable dry spell, we earn our third trophy of the run, a new suit. Which is good, because I was starting to get a bit twitchy. We don't really get a lot of chances to play as Miles in the main story over the next couple of hours, with Peter basically relegating him to the sidelines the entire time, but we do spend that time trying to track down Craven and getting to grips with our new symbiote suit, which is freaking awesome. We crash a party, meet a tiger and give her some pets because she's a good kitty, before eventually confronting Craven in a chapel. While we do manage to get the serum back from him, he also figures out that the sound of the bell makes us go all weak in the knees. Or maybe we're just falling for his burly muscles. Who knows? We head back to the lab to meet Harry and stabilize the serum. Sounds like it's gonna be a while. You hungry? I hate how I the hate neck is. Shut it down and get the antidote. I'll handle this. Oh, will you people just have a day off? While Harry works on shutting down the particle accelerator, we use the opportunity to get even more practice with our new suit, discovering new powers that we can use against our enemies, including some <laughs> terrible quips. Okay down to business there's something i have to tell you i'm fresh out of honey <laughs> <laughs> eh to be fair it is peter i expect nothing less once the serum is stabilized we escape leaving the burning wreckage of the emily may foundation behind us honestly i was pretty devastated to see this it's really true that nothing ever goes right for peter isn't it Ah well, what's next on the agenda? Tracking down the lizard that wants to munch us. Sounds fun. We learn that he's heading to the Harlem fish market. And wouldn't you know it, Miles is just a few blocks away. Pretty sure Peter had basically forgotten about him up until this point, but whatever. 
We track Lizard through the fish market in what is perhaps the most terrifying sequence I've encountered outside of a horror game. That wasn't me. Me neither. I don't even have a stomach, so... Oh! Let's go! Go, go, go! Take him alive! What? 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 Oh, damn, man. Why is everyone so huge in this game? You're gonna be giving me a complex and I'm six foot three. Let's take a moment here, though, to appreciate once again just how cinematic this game is. This whole sequence of chasing Lizard across the river feels like it could have been pulled straight from a movie, and I was loving every second of it. Anyway. Lizard manages to get away, and Peter takes it upon himself to track him down, blaming Miles for him getting away, even though Miles literally saved him after Peter got too cocky, but sure. We head into the sewers and stumble across a secret Oscorp lab containing a meteorite with a strange symbol. Uh, was that me? No, that wasn't you, that was... Never mind. And so begins our fight with the lizard, an absolute monster of an enemy. I will say now, I don't know why, but I found the fights in this game to be considerably more challenging than anything in the first game. For context, I was playing on amazing difficulty, and I was getting absolutely slapped about. It took us a couple of tries and many unnecessary insults from Peter. No wonder your family left you. <laughs> <You're not laughs> Whoa! But we finally managed to hold him down and give him his medicine. Symbiote or no, I would not be sticking my hand anywhere near that chomper. Lizard defeated, Connors takes us to the meteorite once again and we're shown a flashback of its discovery. <laughs> hey Connors, do you need a hand with that? I'm so sorry. Connors says that the symbiote needs to be destroyed, which is the exact opposite of what you should be saying in front of something that looks like, well, that. For completing the mission and becoming a significantly more terrifying version of the symbiote suit, we unlock medicine. Peter heads home and passes out in a slumber, but with hunters closing in on the house, the symbiote does not, and begins wreaking terrifying havoc on them. MJ calls in Miles for help, and the two track Pete to a tunnel in the city. While Miles keeps the hunters at bay outside, MJ heads into the tunnel to track him down. For some unknown reason, because, listen, I don't care how much I love the guy, if they were tearing through a tunnel sounding like a damn T-Rex, mm, I wouldn't be anywhere near that noise. Outside, Miles hears a construction worker calling for help and jumps to rescue him. But... Excuse me! Possible. You're welcome. Oh, I hate these hunters. They're so annoying. They're just crap. They're crap. I'll explain what I mean by crap at the end of the video. Don't worry. Back in the tunnel, MJ has a super very good idea to wake Peter up. Oh dear. Yeah, now he's mad at us. Oh, our first hint of Tony Todd's voice in there, and I can already tell he's going to be terrifying. MJ manages to escape Peter's rampage, and he disappears into the night, leaving Miles behind and at the mercy of Craven. Whew, after such a crazy night, Peter is bound to wake up with one hell of a head. Nope, he's looking pretty chipper, actually. Hmm, I gotta get me some of that symbiote for some shut-eye. Come on, Amazon. 
Harry asks him to come over to his place, and on the way, Peter notices MJ's new article published on the front page of the Daily Bugle, which just straight up trashes him. Ooh. I saw your story. I tried to tell you about that. Yeah, but you didn't, did you? I can't lose this job. Your Pete. job is to write the truth. I did. The truth is, I'm the hero here, not you. Whew, that was just a little bit tense. As he's leaving, Peter runs into Norman, who thanks him for always being there for Harry and tells him he's always been like a son to him. Bit random, but all right. Unfortunately, Harry overhears and doesn't take it well at all. Meanwhile, Miles wakes up to find himself locked in a cage hanging above lasers. He escapes and makes his way through a series of tunnels finding cages along the way that once contained the villains we fought in the first game, now presumably dead at the hands of Craven. Eventually, we emerge into an arena, at the center of which stands Martin Lee. I expected you sooner. Where is the energy of youth, huh? Fight to the death. Oh, okay, it's not a hunter. Or die here together. A hunter who just watches people fight to the death. Okay. The fight with Lee is very reminiscent of the fights from the first game, sending Miles into his own mind and forcing him to confront his demons in an attempt to weaken his resolve. Unfortunately for Lee, he seems to have underestimated Miles. Reverse flux? Woohoo, that's cool. For using this new move and pulling in six enemies simultaneously, we earn Overdrive. Miles reveals his identity to Lee and manages to overpower him, breaking out of the prison of his mind. But despite being given the chance for the revenge he's been seeking throughout the story, he chooses instead to help Lee escape, even at the cost of his own freedom and, potentially, life. Oh, I am damn proud of you, Miles. For completing the mission, we're awarded with another way. Lee does as instructed and tracks down Peter, telling him where Craven is keeping Miles. And then it's finally time for our showdown with Craven. And while swinging our way there, we get this awesome moment of dialogue. He can't even stop some hunters. They destroyed the EMF, destroyed my life. I'm going to lose May's house because of them and Craven. Shivers. Absolute shivers. The fight with Craven is long, featuring multiple stages and plenty of shit talk in which Peter calls out Craven for basically just being an old man dying of cancer who is looking for a more glamorous way to transition into death. Which is accurate as fuck, by the way, because when Craven is basically dead to rights and Miles comes along to save his life, Craven decides to have a little nibble on the symbiote rather than let him. Dude, you need a hug or something, man. Miles yeets Craven with a single punch and turns his attention to Peter. Sorry about that. I just. Ah, oh, great. It's just, it's just me. Oh, I knew it! As soon as I saw the trailer featuring the symbiote suit, I knew Miles would have to fight him at some point. <sighs> Sorry about that, just having a little geek out session there. Again, this fight is long, and Peter is a beast to fight against. But then... Oh, what the fuck? Okay. <laughs> oh, nice to them. Fuck, I feel tired. 
I felt like I had that fight. Yeah, those two fights took me like half an hour overall, and I was genuinely exhausted by the end of them. I had fun, of course, and the fights were filled with some amazing visuals and genuinely emotional moments, but damn, I think I could have run a marathon and not been as tired. Ugh, being a gamer is hard, man. But on the bright side, we finally removed the symbiote suit and earned another trophy, the Great Hunt. Whew, I told you this video was going to be a chonker. And don't worry, this isn't a sponsored segment or anything. Just a quick reminder to stretch your legs and refill your cup of tea if you've been here for a while. And thank you if you have, I do really appreciate it. Anyways, back to the story because it's about to get good. Peter and Miles agree that the best course of action is to take the symbiote to Dr. Connors, who apparently knows how to destroy it. But when we arrive at Oscorp Tower, someone else is waiting for us. Connor said it was- I saved your life! You know what saved mine? Do you want me to die? Oh dear. Oh dear. There he is! No! Don't hurt him! Are you mad? Hi! Jesus! <laughs> I'm Venom? What do you mean? I know that was a pretty long clip, but I just had to show off every moment of that because it was just... Mwah. We rampaged through Osborne Tower, literally tearing and biting our way through the throes of guards sent to stop us until we escape and land in Times Square, where we face off against Craven. But even Craven can't stop us, and soon he finds what he's been looking for. Now I expected something brutal, but jeez, I need a minute after that one. Overcome with the weight of his actions, Harry visits his mother's grave for guidance, but only hears the voice of the symbiote, who tells him exactly what it has planned for the world. What? We're going to heal everyone. And with that terrifying omen laid out before us, we're rewarded with Leave Us Alone. And I'd like to take a moment to specifically thank Insomniac for giving us a chance to play as Venom. They didn't have to do that, but they did. And I'll always love them for it. Peter wakes up in the wreckage of Oscorp Tower the following morning and wastes no time trying to track down Harry. 
He traces the RF signal of his EMF badge, and after getting briefly distracted by a Fantastic Four reference on top of a building, we track it to the underside of a bridge. Hello? Are you okay? Harry? You're not. What the fuck? What the fuck? Who is this? Jesus, these things are terrifying. They're also significantly harder to beat than human enemies, so Peter calls in Miles for his help, and the two fashion a new weapon to weaken them a sonic burst that emits the frequency that disables the symbiote, making them considerably easier to defeat. We get a call from Genki, who tells us that he and Miles' mother are trapped in a train carriage underground, surrounded by goo. Oh dear. Down in the subway, we find a whole mess of something called nerve clusters that control the symbiote strands around it. To destroy them, we need to sync several sonic blasts together and basically blow it up. With the civilians safe and sound, Peter and Miles turn their attention to tracking down Harry. Well, they do, but after we've quickly nabbed another trophy, armed and dangerous, for defeating 100 enemies with our spider arm abilities. Listen, there may be a monster on the loose and literal nests of creatures popping up everywhere, but there's always time for a quick trophy. While Peter and Miles scour the city, MJ deals with a very different type of threat. J. Jonah Jameson who praises her on her latest article and promotes her to editor, with the expectation of more work and even tighter deadlines, of course. She gives Peter a call to share the good news, but Peter instead tries to warn her about what's going on with Harry, just a minute too late. Peter rushes to the house to find them both waiting patiently for him, and because this is another amazing sequence, I'm gonna let you sit back and watch it unfold. You must get tired making the world a better place every single day. But I can help. All you have to do is let me. This isn't you. Wrong. This is the real me. I finally have the power to realize our vision. Are you giving up on me? Harry, we need to get that thing off you. Ugh. Do not call us a thing. Or a parasite. We're not Harry. We are. Why would you jump in the way, fucking MJ? Why are you doing, bro? The fuck? Let her go. Holy shit. This fight is full of amazing dialogue between the characters and is arguably even more emotional than the fight between Peter and Miles. 
Not only is Scream a terrifying villain to face off against, but knowing that it's MJ you're repeatedly decking in the face really pulls on the old heartstrings. As it turns out, MJ is significantly more headstrong than Peter, working with him and against the symbiote to remove it pretty much immediately. And to celebrate, MJ makes a call that she seemed to want to make for a long time. Jonah, kiss my ass. I quit. You're so cool. All right, game, a break now, yes? <laughs> nope. Instead, we get a call from Miles to meet him at City Hall. And when we do, oh my days. We fight our way to the roof of the building to try and save the people trapped inside. But things don't exactly go to plan when the symbiotes manage to overwhelm us. What are you doing here? Are you alright? Yes! Oh, we love a good redemption arc. Unfortunately, Peter has once again been taken over by the symbiote due to some of it still being left inside of him from his previous bond. Lee thinks he knows how to clear it out, so he and Miles head inside Peter's mind. Totally normal thing to do on a Tuesday evening. Interestingly, the symbiote's control over its host works in a very similar way to how Lee would control his victims, using their own fears and desires and twisting them against them. Because of this, the symbiote seems to fear Lee's power and be weak against it. We reach the source of Peter's bond with the symbiote, but it's blocked by a big hunk of flesh? Gross. To break it down, Lee needs to transfer his entire power into it. And with the fate of him once it's done being unknown, Miles takes the opportunity to say some final words. I won't forgive you. It's just not in me. But I can't carry this hate for you anymore, man. So let's set things right. You and me. I really like that he didn't forgive him and kept true to his own emotions while still trying to move on and do the right thing. Really great storytelling. While Lee breaks down the source, Miles kicks the crap out of some more symbiotes. And by using Miles' evolved venom abilities to defeat 100 enemies overall, we earn the trophy Evolved. Lee calls for Miles' help and together they manage to break down the blockage and access the source of Peter's pain. Any guesses on what that might be? Oh, god damn it, not again. But woo, Spider-Man has been saved. Not so woo is now there's a whole bunch of symbiotes thinking that we look real tasty. Oh shit, he hasn't got powers anymore. What? As it turns out, Lee's transference of his power into the symbiote to destroy it actually infused it into Peter giving him anti-venom abilities and the tools to whoop some serious symbiote ass. Whoa, what, is what was that? Defeat a symbiote that is under the effect of anti-venom status. Nice. This is cool. Guess I should thank you. Yes. He gave you his power. I spent years of my life consumed with vengeance. I lost everything for you two reminded me that that's not who I am. When you help someone, you help everyone. Where are you gonna go? To set things right. Your way. Lee's story overall here is one of the best of the entire game, hands down. I was actually sad to see it end, and I hope we get to spend more time with him in any future games. Meanwhile, Venom and Harry are wreaking havoc below ground in Connor's lab in search of the meteorite hidden there. And when he gets his hands on it, things go from bad to very much worse. Oh shit. Uh, 
Um, nah, I got nothing. Venom then turns his attention briefly to Miles, attempting to infect him with the symbiote and telling him to bring Peter to him. He also shows him the location of the meteorite, which Miles immediately reports to Peter once he's broken out of the spell. Unfortunately, this leads Peter directly into a trap. Hold on, I'm nearly to you. Oh God. Thanks for coming, Pete. We want to show you something. Why didn't you move? Once again, Miles arrives just in time to save Peter. Seriously, Pete, you need to get your shit together in this one. The two escape and, with the new location of the meteorite obtained, meet up with MJ to hatch the plan for the final fight with Venom. But it was useless until Harry repaired it. Yeah, and that particle accelerator is what damaged it in the first place. Cut off a piece at low power. Right, so what if we crank the power up? Like way past 11. Might destroy it. And free everyone connected to the hive mind. Theoretically. But that reservoir's gotta be mobbed with symbiotes. And you know Harry's not gonna let that rock out of his sight. <laughs> Unless he sees something he wants more. Me. <laughs> Just, you know, for illustrative purposes. Harry's still Harry. He thinks he's healing the world. But the dream isn't complete without his best friend beside him. I can lead Harry uh, away from the meteorite. And I can handle all the symbiotes. While I grab the space rock. For illustrative purposes. All right. Fire up the accelerator. No more hive mind. World saved. We all get your rose? <laughs> Theoretically. The three musketeers jump into action. While Peter swings away with Venom hot on his tail and Miles gets reacquainted with some symbiotes, MJ takes her new literal gun and storms the hideout, eventually grabbing the meteorite and hightailing it out of there. With that done, we rejoin Peter and begin our final boss battle with Venom. The first part of this fight alone took me almost 20 minutes, but it was so worth it when we're treated to this spectacular sequence. Does it matter? What you do to me? I'm never gonna heal the world with you. Not like this. The meteorite. You took it from us. Uh. Excuse me? Tell me less. You hearing that? Why did you show us pee? How that? Then, it's Miles' turn for the fight. Thankfully, this one was actually easier overall. The mechanics were simpler, and despite Flying Venom being absolutely terrifying to look at, he was much easier to fight. The fight culminates in us blowing Venom's head off briefly, punching the hell out of him while flying in the air. Fucking in one of this, and one of them, and two of them, and all fucking in a bit of that action too, you fucking get the fuck out of my face to get before returning to ground and entering the final sequence. Let's heal the world, Pete. Together. Oh dear. Oh, 
Hey, that is how you do, bud. We're in business. Are we? We did it. Hey, Betsy, doing good? How are you? As someone in my chat put it, Miles the living defibrillator to the rescue. And now all that's left to do is wrap up the story. Despite being saved by Miles, Harry now lives in a permanent coma, one that his doctors warn Norman he may never wake up from, which he's obviously not happy about and specifically blames the Spider-Men for. Lucky Norman Osborn doesn't have any kind of history being an antagonist to Spider-Man, eh? After quitting her job at the Bugle, MJ starts her own podcast, called The New Normal, and moves in with Peter at May's house, where they frequently have guests over. Peter reveals his plan to rebuild EMF, starting out of their garage, and his desire to put his life as Spider-Man on hold. He hands the reins over to Miles, who takes them with confidence, and as they heal the world trophy pops, the credits roll, and Spider-Man 2 comes to a close. Well, kind of. We do also have two post credit sequences, as is the tradition with any Marvel project. The first sees Norman visiting a familiar face at the raft, Doc Ock, and asking for his help, which he refuses to give. He does, however, reveal that he's been working on what he calls... The final chapter. Ominous. And then we finally get to see Miles meeting his mom's new boyfriend. But it's not him who's the point of interest here. It's his daughter, Cindy Moon, and fans of the comics will be well aware of exactly who this is. Whew, we made it! The story is finally done and we can move on to the next stage of our platinum hunt. Despite being roughly 15 hours of playtime, the story missions actually give us very little in the way of trophies, meaning that we currently only have 13 out of 42. Alright, I guess it's time to get to work. Just before we go to the EMF to meet Harry for the first time, Peter is tasked with saving some civilians trapped inside a building on fire. But he soon discovers a cult lurking within the burning walls, as well as the person who has been hunting them down. Hey. Wraith. I never did like my smoking. What? Yuri. Well, life's call me Wraith. What? Pretty well, I think. Why does everyone who comes into contact with Spider-Man go absolutely doolally and either become a crazed supervillain 
or a teetering on the edge anti-hero. We gotta talk about your influence on people, Pete. We storm various locations with Yuri until we're eventually confronted by the cult leader, the Flame. Yuri disagrees with Spider-Man on what the correct course of action is regarding how to deal with this threat. And when he saves the Flame from being killed by her, turns on him as well. I never thought we'd have a sequence of fighting Yuri in the second game, but here we are. Eventually, both the Flame and Yuri escape. But in the final part of the side missions, we manage to track down both of them once again. Peter and Yuri realize that the Crimson Hour seems to refer to a plan to run an Oscorp train into a couple of tankers to blow up a city block. While derailing said train, Spider-Man manages to get himself trapped underneath it, because of course he does, giving the flame a chance to reveal what his true plan was all along. That's what all this was for. And when the Crimson Hour rolls over this earth, it shall bring truth. It's carnage, isn't it? Judgment. Oh, hell yeah! Yuri is presented with a choice to chase after him or to save Peter's life. Thankfully, she chooses the latter and tells us that she'll continue looking for him and report back when she has more information. Hell of a storyline to set up Carnage, and we earn ourselves Crimson Hour for completing it. Throughout the game, we see Miles trying to juggle being Spider-Man and being a student at his school. Brooklyn Visions Academy. But a series of side missions tasks you with combining those two identities by helping out various students across the BV campus. These missions really are a varied bunch, from helping one person ask his boyfriend to homecoming, to taking pictures of the campus for the drone club, to even saving the BV mascot from a rival school who have kidnapped it. And once we've completed them all, the students show their appreciation by making Spider-Man a brand new suit, which is actually really cool. We also earn the trophy, Brooklyn Pride. Another set of side missions from Miles sees us trying to track down the instruments and items of heritage that have been stolen from the local museum. With the museum on the brink of financial collapse, a potential donor, this guy, has been called in to help but his support is withdrawn due to the theft. Miles is asked to help by his mother, Rio, and after tracking down various items that have been stolen, we eventually find out who the mastermind behind the whole operation is. Louis got picked up by the cops. He don't got no saxophone. You set this meeting up. No, we do <gasps> Now where's our money? It's the donor! The you bitch. This was an interesting storyline dealing with the themes of culture and heritage and who historical artifacts actually belong to, eventually culminating in us getting a real life history tour of the musical scene of Brooklyn over the years. And Miles gets to have a little dance with his mom. Cute. For completing these missions and returning the stolen goods to their rightful owners, we're awarded with My Community. One of the most wholesome, but also most annoying side missions from the first game required you to rescue various pigeons that had escaped from their home in order to help a guy named Howard. Throughout those missions, we learn more about him and his deceased wife, and his story is really touching overall. And so I was excited when we got the chance to reconnect with him again in this game. He asks us if we can help him with his pigeons once again. This time we're finding them a new home because he is getting ready for a new adventure of his own. It doesn't take us long to do so and we head back to Howard to tell him the good news. Oh no. Howard? Yep. Looks like natural oh hey Spider-Man. Hey, sorry. Friend of mine. Take all the time you need. If it helps, um... It looked like he was at peace. He was. He's finally on that adventure with his wife. Oh, I'd figured out what was happening fairly quickly into the mission, but man, it still didn't make the punch any easier to take. And yes, this is me trying my hardest to hold back tears, all right? Shit's emotional. We wipe away the tears and celebrate our trophy, a new adventure.
We'll miss you, Howard. Alongside the trophy for completing Howard's story, we also earned another for completing all of the app requests. Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man. These requests pop up throughout the game and require you to do a bunch of random tasks. Honestly, this wasn't even a trophy I was paying attention to, and just stumbled on hand in hand with Howard's. But I'm not complaining, as that pop gets us another step closer to the Platinum. We then turn our attention to the collectibles that we need to hunt down. The first being Marco's Memory Crystals. Right back at the beginning of the game, just after defeating Sandman, Miles comes across a strange crystal. As it turns out, these are fragments of Marco's mind being guarded by his subconscious. And by breaking open the crystal, we start to learn more of his story leading up to the start of the game. We find the rest of them scattered across the map, with each new one merging together and eventually forming a statue of Marco and his daughter, Kimia. Finding them all restores Marco's mind, and now that he's able to think clearly, he asks us to check on his daughter and give her the crystal statue when we find her. When we do, we earn Grains of Sand. When Venom acquires the meteorite and begins taking control of the city, one of the byproducts is the formation of various nests. At the center of these nests is a heart, which we need to disable with a sonic blast in order to clear out. If you're planning on tackling this run yourself, I'd highly recommend waiting until you've maxed out your powers and acquired the anti-venom suit because holy hell are these difficult. You basically just get absolutely bombarded by enemies and have to fight for your life until the blast goes off. The symbiote surge also really came in clutch for me, so I'd recommend using that too. It takes us a minute, but once we've cleared out all of the nests, we earn Exterminator. Journeying back to the start of the game once again, when Peter loses his job, Miles recommends he tries out for a photo competition for Robbie Robertson, a former employee of the Daily Bugle. Robbie wants to see the true heart of New York. So we start by taking a picture of two guys throwing a frisbee across a couple of rooftops. Doing so unlocks the photo opportunities across the city, which fans of the first game probably remember well. When we take our final picture, we earn New York, New York. Sorry about that. Once we've taken the job with Harry at EMF, he tells us about a few research stations that have been set up across the city by scientists working at the foundation. That's right, once again, Harry is sending us to do side missions associated with research stations. Typical. These are all basically the same formula that we encountered during our first introduction to the company. Saving bees from predators, testing out some new bicycles, and creating new forms of stronger plants. They're nice little breaks from the main story, and overall quite fun to complete, even if there aren't actually that many of them in comparison to the first game. Once they've all been done, we get a call from MJ telling us that a package has been left for us at the house by Norman Osborne. If it's a green goblin bomb, I swear to... Oh, it's just a hard drive. Heh, <laughs> phew. The drive contains a message from Harry telling us about the impacts we've had thanks to our hard work and thanking us for being a part of the mission with him. After the events of the story, this part is just... Oh, come on now, game. Give me a break here before you make a grown man cry again. Harry gifts us with the life story suit as a thank you, and we unlock Foundational. For our next trophy... We switch back to Miles and return to the Mysteriums that we first encountered back at Coney Island. After dealing with the initial malfunction back then, Quentin and his team calls us back and asks us to help test the rest of them, believing that a malicious force has somehow infiltrated the code of the games. As we work through each one, we earn pieces of the diaries recorded by the devs, which give us an insight into what was happening behind the scenes. As these progress, we're led to believe that Quentin has once again gone off the rails and readopted the mantle of Mysterio. But by overcoming the final boss fight, we learn the truth. The sim is down. Get it back. <coughs> I'm trying. I knew it. I fucking knew it. I fucking knew it. No shit. It was Quentin. 
He made us uh. do this. Where is he? Oh. In here. Yep, the game made me feel bad for Mysterio. Damn, nicely done. And for learning the truth and clearing the name of an innocent man, we earn Behind the Masks. One of my favorite Spider-Man villains is The Prowler, and so I was super psyched to see Uncle Aaron return in this game. Unfortunately for me, but fortunately for Miles, Aaron has hung up the Prowler mask for good. Damn it. And with Prowler retired, he asks for Miles' help with recovering some hidden tech parts that he's stashed around the city to ensure that they don't fall into the wrong hands. These missions focus on solving puzzles and discovering secrets, which was honestly a nice break from the constant combat throughout the rest of the game, so I enjoyed working my way through them. Once all stashes have been acquired, we pick up the signal of another one that Aaron didn't tell us about. Inside, we find a blueprint to an apartment in Miles' building, and worry that our uncle has once again fallen off the Prowler wagon. But when we confront him, we find out that Rio has actually helped Aaron get a new apartment above our own, so that he can be closer to the family. Cute! Still wanted to see the Prowler again though. Aaron gets a new chance at his life, and we get a new trophy. Co-signing. Next up, we return to the Hunter Blind side missions that we unlocked earlier in the game. Each one reveals the location of a Hunter base that we need to clear out. Doing so also gives us snippets into the backstory of Craven's family and what happened with them after he left. Basically, each member of his family seems to be vying for the honor of… killing him? This is a strange family dynamic. Ultimately, his daughter Anna is the one who dispatches her brothers and mother, and then vows to hunt down Craven. We obviously know that she's only going to find half of her father, but the threat of her arrival means that the Spider-Men are now set to be on their guard. What do we reckon? Possible DLC? For clearing out the Hunters, we earn a new suit and seek and destroy. Another set of side missions associated with the Hunters involves trying to identify the targets of their drones. Chasing down each one and downloading the data on it gives us more pieces of the puzzle, but raises more questions as to who exactly Craven is targeting, as the people on his apparent hit list don't really make a lot of sense. Some of them are even already dead. Eventually, our search leads us to this apartment, where a voice, believing us to be Craven, begins speaking to us. Over the course of the dialogue, we learn that Craven hasn't been searching for multiple targets, but in fact just one, the chameleon, his brother. We escape the trap set for him, but unbeknownst to us, the chameleon watches us as we do and vows to finish what his brother started. Why is everyone always trying to kill us, for crying out loud? Learning the truth earns us Data Collector. And now our final collectible slash side mission trophy, and easily my favorite of the game, the Spider-Bots. These work in the same way to the backpacks from the first game. They're dotted around the city, and we need to find each one and grab them. And look at how cute they are! Each one is themed to a different Spidey, as well as a few that are modeled after other characters. But the whole thing is a bit strange, right? Why are we finding these bots around New York that clearly belong to spider men and women that we've never seen before? And why are they emitting this strange pulse when we find them? Huh, that feels kind of familiar. Eventually, after finding all 42 of them, Ganki manages to track the signal of someone else who is trying to track them down. Ganki, you seeing this? Bro, what the hell is happening? <laughs> Look at this, a spider hero. We're all saved. Let me take those off your hands. Whoa! 
Thank you, Spider Man. And if Miguel comes looking for these, if Miguel. Don't keepers. Wait, who's Miguel? <laughs> I mean, we already knew that the Insomniac universe is in the Spider Verse, thanks to Peter's cameo in the second film, but this was still really awesome to see. For completing our final set of collectibles and side missions, we earn two more trophies. Funky wireless protocols for locating the origin of the spider bots, and superior for 100%ing all districts. Nice. Still with me? All right, let's turn our attention to the remaining trophies that we earn for completing various miscellaneous tasks across the game. The first group comes from upgrading our Spider-Men and leveling up throughout the game. We earn Resourceful for collecting a total of 10,000 tech parts, To the Max for purchasing all gadget upgrades, Fully Loaded for purchasing all of the suit tech upgrades, Kitted Out for purchasing all suits for both characters, and finally, Amazing for reaching the maximum level of the game. We also mopped up the remaining combat trophies that we had missed while playing the main game. Early in the story, we unlock a new gadget to use during the stealth sections of the game, the web line. This was a really nice addition in my opinion, and the trophy attached to it was pretty simple to grab. All we had to do was perch take down 25 enemies whilst on a line to unlock slackline. And then we had surge, one I really wish I was aware of early in the game because I could have crossed it off much sooner than I did. Once we've unlocked the symbiote abilities and the symbiote surge power, the game tasks us with using both of them at the same time 25 times. Because I had left this one until after I'd completed all of the missions in the game, I had to spend about 20 minutes hunting down various crimes in order to unlock it. Yeah, my advice? Get it done early. Our next four trophies were earned for completing mini challenges to do with our new suit technologies and the city of New York in general. To start with, we head to the Big Apple Ballers Stadium and round the bases to earn Home Run. Round the bases. I have never felt more British than I did the first time I read that and had no idea what it was talking about. Then we switch to Miles and head to the Trinity Church from his first game where we find the science trophy that he and Finn left behind there. We get a sweet moment of reflection from Miles and the Just Let Go trophy. One of the coolest new additions to this game in comparison to the first is the web wings that both Spider-Men have. These allow you greater traversal around the larger city map and are just fun to use in general. And the game challenges you to put your control over these wings to the test by having you travel from the financial district to Astoria using only them. Much more intimidating on paper than in reality because as long as you take advantage of the wind tunnels between the two destinations, this challenge is a cinch, earning us sore. Only three trophies left before the platinum and we're now tasked with performing 30 air tricks in a row without touching the ground in order to earn Hang 10. And I did a bit of a dumb with this one. I managed to convince myself that I needed to perform a 30 combo with my tricks in order to earn this trophy, and because swinging and using my web wings reset that counter, I was just trying to perform as many tricks as possible after jumping off the tallest building, which didn't exactly go well for me. In fact, I earned another trophy, Splat, for attempting a trick and landing on the ground. Way to rub salt in the wound there, game. Eventually, I figured out that I just had to perform the tricks in the air regardless of if I also swung in between or not. Once I'd made that breakthrough, the trophy was really easy to unlock. And now, the finale. The final trophy, and one which I had actually specifically left until now because I knew it would be the best ending to our run. Are we ready? Let's do it. Parker Lux back with a vengeance. I figured to round it all off, it would be nice to leave it with a visit to May's gravestone. And I did it. 
I have platinumed Spider-Man 2 within 72 hours of it being released. Oh, I love having this as a job. What a weird job this is. 26 hours and a whole host of emotions later, and we unlock Dedicated, the platinum trophy for Spider-Man 2. I'm sad that the run is over, but I am buzzing to say that another platinum trophy hunt is completed. Let's start by addressing what everyone was thinking when this game was announced. Damn, it's got a lot to live up to. And it really does. The first Spider-Man game is not only regarded as one of the best games we've had in recent times, but also one of the best trophy achievement hunting games in general. So while I was very excited to get my hands on this one, I was also a little bit apprehensive of what was in store. As it turns out, I didn't need to be because I was in the safest of hands. Insomniac has once again knocked it out of the park with this one and created one of the best video games I've ever had the pleasure of experiencing. The story is full of emotion and pays homage to the events of the first game while still taking its own step forward to become its own thing. Most of the characters were a joy to spend time with and the combination of the two Spider-Men was really well done. It felt like they were both supposed to be there, and they both had a purpose. I would argue that Miles was perhaps a touch more instrumental in the hero work than Peter, but to be fair, this was Pete's symbiote storyline, so that was to be expected. My only gripe with the story was the fact that I'd basically predicted every beat of it just from seeing the trailers online, like a lot of people. I really wished I'd gone into it blind, because I think certain moments would have had more impact, like Harry becoming Venom. But then again, if you're a fan of Spider-Man stories in any way, then you probably could have predicted it even without seeing the trailers. For example, without the original Venom, Eddie Brock, being in the picture, and the symbiote having a relationship with Harry from the very start, who else really was there to take the mantle? That being said, none of it detracted from the joy of watching it unfold in front of me in the slightest. The game included extra surprise segments that still took me off guard, like actually getting to play as Venom and the fate of the other villains from the previous game. So I have no complaints there. Maybe I'll just avoid trailers in the future. However, I do have a complaint elsewhere, specifically with Craven. I'm going to be honest. I really didn't like Craven in this game. Now, full disclosure, I'm not a die-hard Spidey fan, so I haven't read every comic and played every game and watched every piece of media associated with the character. So this was actually my first introduction to Craven, and I'm not impressed. He's literally called Craven the Hunter, and yet for pretty much the whole game, he's just getting everyone else to do the hunting for him. And then he has the audacity to march onto the scene once all the hard work has been done and act like he's done something. Basically, he gives me the same energy as that guy who would do no work during the group project, but would then just turn up on the day of presentation and get the highest grade, and then would act smug about it. Oh, feck off. From what I've seen online though, this adaptation of the character was pretty faithful. So this isn't a criticism of Insomniac, but more a rebuttal of the overall character. He was just boring to me, and I was thankful when he eventually got munched. Other than that, I really did love everything else. Venom was terrifying, and Tony Todd did a phenomenal job with his voice. The side missions were filled with more emotion than I see in most full game stories, and I just never wanted to stop playing. The big question is though, was it better than the first game? Honestly, for me, no it wasn't. The combat and the traversal systems were much better and felt smoother and more fun across the board, but the story wasn't as good in my opinion, and the game overall doesn't feel as full as the first one, if that makes sense. This isn't to say that Spider-Man 2 is a bad game, not at all. But if I had the chance to replay one of them and only one, I'd pick the first game. So what of the Platinum Hunt? Well, if you're here this long and you've watched this absolute behemoth of a video that I took the time to create for it, then you probably already know my answer to that one. I loved it. 
The majority of the hunt came from the side missions and maxing out your character levels, but the other little challenges thrown in here and there were very nice touches. I guess if I had to think of a criticism for the hunt, I'd say that I wanted just a little bit more. Comparing it to the first game, it's actually one of the reasons I said earlier that this game didn't feel as full. There was more to do in the first, and more trophies to unlock, or at least it felt that way. So if they had included an extra couple of things that I had to do that were specifically for the trophies, like the interacting with civilians trophy from the first game, that would have been really nice to see. But it was still a fun ride and I loved every minute of it. Whoo! And there we have it. The Spider-Man 2 Platinum is in the bag and I have officially released my longest video of the channel. I really hope you guys enjoyed it, and if you did, please let me know by leaving a like and a comment down below. Also, if there are any more hunts that you want to see from me on this channel, let me know in the comments which ones, and subscribe for a brand new trophy or achievement hunt every single week, and to support me as a creator. Thank you so much for watching, have a great day, and happy hunting.